Good afternoon. I'm here at my home, and we are talking continue. And what I'm doing <laughs> is um, right I there. want to take you back that's to when I um, okay. got a family picture. Second, I heard second, that my great grandmother was a twin. Y'all can carry on. A um, twin, and I wanted to see a picture of the twin. And when I saw the picture, I you know, I was like, you know, kind of taken because I thought they would be identical. But like everybody said, but I didn't see them as identical. But of course, there were some other pictures that came along. And one of the pictures was um, from 1949. And it was a really um, professional um, picture. And they had um, a lot of musicians. And I, when I got to the bottom, it said the um, orchestra of First African Baptist Church. And so I went to the church and I said, you know, this, they have to be able to um, see this picture because I know they probably don't have it. Just, you know, just want to take it to the church, let the people see it. Well, anyway, when I got there, I met um, now where you will see um, pictures of, we would do a professional, um, like almost like a documentary of growing up in Richmond. And Deborah Booker, who is the historian for um, First African Church, and my mother are here. And she's like, okay, comparing notes. Who is this person? Who is that person? And she's actually got, um, was so glad that I came because I had was the missing piece to kind of bring um, fate, names to the faces in a book dated as early as 1928. And so um, my mom, they're sitting at the table now behind me. And they are uh, comparing notes and saying, hey, who is this and who is that? Who's this person? Who is that person? And just kind of get, um, getting some um, family history. Um, I just felt a need to do this because my mom has always said, hey, I want to write a book. Um, and so many lost treasures that we, um, we lost along the way in our black community. This is Black History Month, and we've lost a lot of treasures as far as um, education, I would hear my mom talk about her teachers and her school. They had a lot of uh, plays, school plays, and the teachers took personal interest in the students mm -hmm. and um, how they were in the community. So what I want to do is lead the conversation and kind of guide mm -hmm. through. And then, of course, our family um, was at First African Church. So I thought it would be no better time than now to bring everything together, put um, names to these faces and um, tell a story about about um, Richmond history and how how it was through our own work. Mm -hmm. All right, you can stay tuned. I'm Carolyn Smith, Carolyn McLemore Smith, and who I have beside me is my mother, Carolyn McLemore, and I also have Deborah Booker. Who is um they grew we all grew up in Richmond and we can all tell our version of our story growing up in Virginia. Where for me, I think I've taken on to take a personal interest in family history as well as Richmond history because it's intertwined. Um, hearing my mom talk over the years about growing up in Richmond, um, talking about school systems. Um, I remember in particular, uh, Mr. Booker. Mm -hmm. He was grandma's teacher, and he was your teacher, right? Mm -hmm. Tell a little bit about him. Well, Mr. Booker was, uh, when you talk about black people and our rights and our history, he was already phenomenal back in his time. We learned so much from him about black people and the things that we had gone through. In our classroom, uh, was pictures all around the wall of black people that had made difference all, all, the, all our life. They talked about uh, going to school, one-room schoolhouses, mm -hmm. and, and Jim Crow, mm -hmm. and uh, all of the things that, that we were so afraid of. Uh, just trying to learn to read and write was a crime. And uh, even back to the point that you could not look at a white person in the face. You always had to hold your head down. And it was always, yes, sir, yeah, yes, ma'am, and like that. Uh, as I came along, uh, I, I, I was 
in school was all segregated. All, all segregated, our neighborhood was segregated, our churches were the biggest part of segregation. So we had our own church in our neighborhood, Bethlehem Baptist, and we had our own school, Buchanan School. It was a wonderful neighborhood. We all were like family. But when they got ready to put in the Mosby Court and all of that, they decided to tear it all down. But let me ask you, um, I notice you always talk about um, Mr. Booker. You also talk about um, Miss West. Yes, Miss West was my fourth grade teacher, and she was another person that was phenomenal. She went to Ebenezer Baptist Church, as us that's here now know that that was one of our greatest uh, Baptist churches, and most of our educated blacks went to Ebenezer. And so Miss West, she too was all into black history mm -hmm. that one week that we got. And she was all into that. We learned a lot of poems and uh, readings and everything about black people. And uh, she, when Jackie Robinson hit the leagues, oh my God, when it came on, class was down. We all had to listen to the game, right? <laughs> we listened to the game, and she would just be walking and cheering and everything. And at, at that time, we didn't really understand how important all of this really was. Well, Miss West became so attached to me that when her sister died, she asked me to ask my mom if I could come live with her. And so... For I went to live with Miss West uh, for less than a year. I loved it dearly, mm -hmm. but it separated me from my sister. Mm -hmm. And of course, up on Clay Street, where she lived, 811 West Clay Street, you know, that was Jackson Ward then. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was full of people with uh, prestige and doctors, lawyers, and everything. Mm -hmm. The best of the best that we had lived up there. And, and so I lived with her for a while. And uh, it, it was a great value to me, the things that I learned from her. A lot of things that I do now, I learn from her. She said, you polish your furniture, go down and get the legs and the feet, too, <laughs> but, on the furniture. Well, you notice I was saying that. I, was, I, I put on my post. I said, my mom said, if you want to clean it, make it shine. That's right. <laughs> so um, I noticed that for Miss West, I also want to um, bring to you um, in the community. Now, that was Miss Williams. Right? Yes, Miss Williams was the neighborhood person that she was our doctor. She could tell you things legal. Mm -hmm. She could, uh, when the babies got sick, you take it to her. Take it to her. She'd make these little things in a little sack to hang it around the baby's mm -hmm. neck. That's supposed to keep her, keep them from teething hard. If you cut your feet, you go to Miss Williams. She took the basin, put it down, and she squeezed it. Squeeze it and put your feet in that cold water. Wrap it up and you go. You got a fever, she put onions on the bottom of your feet. Can you and remember senior, her first name? Uh, I, um, I believe it was Elise Williams. Okay. Her and her whole family lived in that house. Uh, two, uh, three grown children, their wife and children. They all lived there. So Miss Williams was the only person in the neighborhood that had a telephone. Oh, that's what I want to talk about. So she would get on the front porch and yell out, Mary Girl, telephone! <laughs> and she would she would do that for everybody with the telephone. And to keep the kids busy and give us a little money to do, she would have the people to come and dump wood in front of her house. Uh, at, at, at the time, I didn't know what kind of wood it was, but I think it was from somewhere that made furniture. Because oh. it'd be smooth wood mm -hmm. cut in squares. Mm -hmm. And we got... Uh, 25 cent to help her get all that in her tool house. So twice a year, we, we had that to do. Miss mm -hmm. Williams was the key to all pretty much knowledge and everything in our neighborhood. Okay, I'll, I'm kind of guiding this conversation because I'm going to go from forward and then we're going to go backwards because that's how we found out this information. So um, you had Miss Williams, you had Mr. Booker, you had Miss West, mm -hmm. and then um, you would, would how would it be? How was it like um, 
in your community because I know you went to your friend's house and you saw how they had everything decorated, which helped influence your um, style and taste in home decor. When you, um, was it your best friend from kindergarten, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, Francis, from second grade. Second grade. Um, we know her today. She ended up being my teacher, Miss Kenya, Frances Kenya. And to my mother, she was Frances Butler. Mm -hmm. So when you went to her house years ago, that's when you recognized. We're picking up these all the little treasures that I ended up picking up from her, where she got them from. So when you went there, well, you know, where we live, you know, you might get an annoying every two years or three years, four years, five years. A lot of times the know you don't have a hole in it mm -hmm. by the time you get a new one. And sometimes you can see straight to the ground because mm -hmm. the wood would be rotten too. And our walls were so bad, we had like old clothes stuck in the walls to keep the air out. And in the wintertime, we had three rooms, but in the wintertime we lived in one room. Because mm -hmm. you had a pot, uh, tall pot belly stove, you cooked on it. You, you warm your water for bathing and everything mm -hmm. on that. We had a ch table and three chairs. And so I was going to be in a play. I was a very popular little girl. I could sing very well. And every program at school, I had to be on the programs. And, and my mama told me, she said, you got to stop that. We don't have money to buy, you know, and I needed shoes. Mm -hmm. So my friend Frances, she lived with her grandparents, and she lived on uh, Fifth Street, mm -hmm. which was still in the Jackson Ward, so you know it was very nice. Never been into anything like that, even though my grandparents had a nice home in, in Northside on 8 West Graham Road. This lady had style in class. When I walked in the door, and she had the red carpet, through the living room, a formal dining room, uh, a baby grand piano in there, and family pictures. Uh, and I was just blown away. I was just blown away. And I went into her kitchen. She had a cook stove, but it was the queen of the cook stoves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the pearl handles on the... Mm -hmm. I, I, I just couldn't believe it. And then I went upstairs and found out that Frances had a bedroom of her own and even had a sewing machine. So I came home and I took a good look. My mirrors, that's why I was telling her today how much I love the mirrors. When people have mirrors, clean them and make them shine. We couldn't even see in the mirror. You know, uh, and what I, I described to you is, well, they used to call our area the skid row. Okay. Actually, the skid row. But we still was a family of people. You could go across the street and ask for two slices of bread, yeah. a cup of sugar, and you give me a half a stick of butter, uh, whatever. But when I came home, I, I, was, I was so ashamed. And I started drawing pictures and used flour and water for paste mm -hmm. and tried to put them on the wall to cover, cover all of the holes and everything was there. I scrubbed the floors, I cleaned the mirrors and everything and it's just been in me since that time. Uh, you don't have to get everything new, right. but beautify the things that you have. I love my old stuff because it's a treasure. Mm -hmm. It's a treasure. Now, um, when you were um, growing up, as far as you can re remember back, for your grandparents and all, it's kind of, what do you know about the, um, the right family, you know, as far as? Now, you know, back in, back in that time, I think it was 54 okay. or, or something like that when my grandparents first moved there. We lived in the 30, 13th Street Bottom, which we called back then. And then they built the E.G. Williams Hospital and Mass Massey Cancer Center. Down that hill was a whole neighborhood down there. So my granddaddy said, uh, I'm going to take you. I was the first grandchild. So he said, we're going to take, uh, take you to see the new house. And 
that's when I saw the house at 8 West Graham Road. Oh. And uh, it was classy people living in Northside. I'm really, really. It's classy people. And uh, we always felt like most of the light-skinned people <laughs> lived in Northside. That was the rumor. <laughs> that was true. Yeah. And uh, they were educated people. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it was nobody going to Miss Williams or Holly across the street for the telephone. All those conveniences were right in my grandparents' house. Mm -hmm. And that made me want it, things, seeing things, and, 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 I, and I really appreciated that. And we spent as much time as we could there, all the whole summers. You know, they'll pick us up right when school let out that same day and bring us back the day school started. And we spent all the Christmas, any holidays, we, we were there. Now, those were your grandparents on your mom's side, your dad's side? Dad's side, dad's the, the Wrights. Okay. Uh, my grandfather's name was Carl Harrison Wright. Mm -hmm. My daddy's name was Carl Harrison Wright Jr. And I was the first grandchild, so I was named Carolyn mm -hmm. to go right along with the, with the Carol. And so now I've named my daughter Carolyn. So, uh, then your grandmother's name was Edith. Was Edith, Edith Massey, and she, uh, um, they were married until she, she died. My grandfather. Her daughter was, was a Edith too. Edith, my grandfather was the best of the best. He uh, had so much patience, so kind. That's my aunt Edith. Mm -hmm. So patient and kind and loving. And when my grandmother got sick, she wouldn't eat or anything for anybody but him. I never had nobody that had that much patience, and God still blessed me with a mind very much like him. Hallelujah, Granddad. I knew what to look for. <laughs> if you've never seen it, you won't know. Yeah. So uh, my grandparents was a great influence on me wanting to get some education and stuff. Now, um, when you, I remember um, when we first, you know, I remember living in an apartment, and my mom wanted the house, and when I re remember her saying, I like this house because it reminds me <coughs> of my grandparents' house. Mm -hmm. And um, it, we lived across from um, Fonticello Park. We lived across from the tennis court, mm -hmm. and we had a spring. And where it turned out that your great-grandfather lived across from the tennis court, mm -hmm. as well as your grandparents, all live in the same community. They, they As you know it, I, um, and then, then from there we'll turn it over and um, Deborah would explain everything that she explained to me once I got to the church. <laughs> so when you, um, as far as you know, you said the right family, everybody bought together, they bought homes together, like not together, but they used the same. In a circle. Uh -huh. If you use that salesman, they went to that salesman. Mm -hmm. okay. They bought a certain brand car. Mm -hmm. They bought a certain, and everybody did the same thing. They were all very, um, they were, um, they were a family, and they also consulted one another for everything, right? One of the things that um, that bothered me uh, from childhood uh, to today is the fact that. Most of my people on my, on my dad's side of the family, the Wrights, they were very light people. And it really hurt me when my daughter said uh, that they didn't wonder when she went to a funeral of William Wright III, they asked, said they never knew anything about her. Well, I can't remember anybody in that family talking to me coming to me, you take a little girl and you say, well, you know, how you doing? Mm -hmm. What you mm -hmm. doing? Or uh, whatever. And uh, we were like the lost sheep. Mm -hmm. We were like the lost sheep, but my grandfather never felt that way. Okay. He was great with us. Of course, my dad and my uncle Richard, call him Pap and Edith, they loved us dearly. But there was a stigma. Yeah. And during that period of time, it was not abnormal. No. At all. Not at all. Even down to uh, the high schools, if you was, went to Maggie Walker, uh, you, you had a chance of being something, it wasn't what color you was. 
But it, when you went to Armstrong, you you got the light bright yes. and doggone near white yes. to do to yep. to be anything in anything. Yeah. So yeah, it it was a and it bothers me that the family don't didn't know anything about us. As but the the current family is not their fault, you know. But even uh, senior. He, he, I never remember him ever saying anything to me, but I was around all the time. Which senior? William, William senior. Really? So, uh, so from there, um, move it along with the family. I remember when I was in the fifth grade, I wanted to play the flute. Mm -hmm. And from there, it was a, a long time, um, bless her heart, Miss Walker. She recently passed away. Yes. And her daughter, Paula ended up being my friend, and she played the flute. First I wanted to play the clarinet, and then that kind of went by me. But when Paula played the flute, I said, oh, I want to play the flute with Paula. And when I came home, my mom said, well, you know, all the Wrights played instruments. Mm -hmm. You know, they want you to play a sport, and you play, they played instruments. And that's, I didn't think anything more about it, which I started in the fifth grade. I remember going to my fifth grade concert and I thought it was a big deal because I could finally wear my mom's shoes <laughs> that she wore in Francis' wedding. And I was able to wear the shoes and do my first concert at Patrick Henry School. But, you know, of course I played the flute I, and now I, I picked it up as a hobby now. But when I went to hearing the story about my, the family and my mom, say so you were five years old when they purchased a home and how the um, com community, how they would travel with the band, and mm -hmm. you would go with them. That's right. You know about that. And you said you would, they would tr go, they would, was it the Elf Band? Explain what, well, how we, that was. Well, the, the Sunday school band, most of those uh, men end up going into the Elks Band also. Mm -hmm. And so they used to be in parades. Mm -hmm. So some of the parades were in different parts of Virginia or whatever. But we might have a caravan of five or six cars, mm -hmm. and all of the women would prepare all the foods, delicious stuff, and everything, have tablecloths and everything. But we had to find a special place mm -hmm. that black people could stop. Right. And, and we had to use the bathroom, it had to be in the woods uh, somewhere. Mm -hmm. And they'd be looking for a safe place mm -hmm. for, you to do, to, for you to do that. You just couldn't no. just do that. But uh, that's all we knew, and we enjoyed really just being black folks. And uh, so I didn't know that anything was wrong. You're right. You're exactly right. Be, you know, not being with the white people. We didn't go to school with them. We didn't go to church with them. And I remember when I got in high school and I would catch the bus, um, before they gave us the school bus. Mm -hmm. So I was catch the bus and look at the white kids and I couldn't stop looking at them. I was mesmerized. You know, how they get so light? <laughs> you know, their skin look like milk. Look at their hair. You know, <laughs> I was mesmerized with them and to be honest with you, they was mesmerized with me mm -hmm. too. And I guess, Deborah, when you got started being with uh, your first encounter with white girls or something like that, the first thing they want to do is touch your hair. Oh, on my face. And your face. Mm -hmm. You see, you feel like us. <laughs> you they, you feel like us and feel your hair. Say, your hair feel like our hair. No. Yeah. No, they didn't tell me my hair felt like their hair because my hair, their hair was straight and you might have been wearing an afro or something like No, that. when I first had my first encounter, I was maybe six years old. Oh, well, you was way be before me. And they just, I, I, didn't, I don't have a picture of me at that, oh, it's in this book. But anyhow, my hair, my mom's hair was a different texture because of her father. Mm -hmm. So my hair was sort of ringlet curly and they sort of like yours, like mm -hmm. this, you know, and they were touching full full and yeah. you know, and they I remember a girl saying, Are you black? <laughs> and I said, No, I'm a Negro. Because that was nineteen 
That must have been 1959. And it was all, almost like an uh, insult for that's somebody right. to call you black. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> 1959, it wasn't an insult. No. Oh, wow. Nobody wanted to be called black. Mm -hmm. Well, um, as we move right along, <laughs> and we're guiding, guiding because we, we got through now to the 50s, we got through, um, you, did you, you went to church with your grandparents? Yes. And then you went to church on Saturdays with your aunt, making the program. Yes, we did the bulletins uh, for First African Baptist Church. My sister and I, and my cousin Ricky, uh, which was her son, we would go on Saturdays and do the bulletins. And that was one of our little jobs, and she would give us out, you know, um, out, what you call it, you give, give them a little, you give the kids a little money. Uh, like an allowance or something? Yeah, allowance. Mm -hmm. She'd give us like 50 cents. Mm -hmm. And that was a whole lot of money mm -hmm. then. We could buy three or four two to fruit of ice cream right. cones. Right. And so um, she always made it so it was fun for us to, to do that. And as, as time went on, we still was living in this black world. It, you know, but we knew that if you, you know, we didn't have fast foods. No. Fast food restaurants, not no. Yet, not yet. Mm -mm. Not yet. And I know when we first started getting them, it might, might be in the first place, might have been the White Tower mm -hmm. or something That's like right. that. That's right. And you had to go to the little side window. That's right. And order, you just peep through it. You know, order what you're going to order or whatever. Then it got to the point, you could come in the door, but you better not put your hands on the counter or the or the chairs or anything. You had to put your hands behind the sky. If you was coming in there That's to right. order ice cream cone or anything, you had to do that. So we were starting to feel. We were starting to feel. To it. recognize the difference. Yes, and mm -hmm. mind you, now, hadn't got to the really 60s Not yet. yet. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Now, um, Deborah, now at this point, when you, when did you join First African Church? I was born in First African mm -hmm. Church because my mom was a member of First African Church, First African Baptist, and she was born. My mom started going to First African Baptist when she was 10 months old. Okay. And just like you said, she lived in Navy Hill, and it was a, a community. Yes. So the older adults from Navy Hill, the older mothers, mm -hmm. would go, just like you said, from mm -hmm. house to house saying, we're going to Sunday school, get your babies ready. Mm -hmm. And they would get those children ready for Sunday school, even though my mother's mother and grandmother were members of Sharon Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. But we lived on, I'm sorry, not we, they lived on 10th Street. Mm -hmm. So First African was, was 14th and Broad. Mm -hmm. So the, the mothers of the neighborhood would get the children ready and my grandmother sent my mom with those ladies. And they, just like the Pied Piper, they gathered those babies up and those children up and they walked from 10th and Clay all the way. Well, it wasn't just only 14. It was from 10th to 14. It's only four, four blocks. Okay. So they just, and then, you know, with the traffic, this was 1931, 32, 33, there was no, and they just took them uh, past MCV, mm -hmm. you know, and they would walk to church. So my mom was born, was raised at First African, and then I was raised. So I, I've only known First African Baptist Church, and she's only known First, First African Baptist, even though her mom and grandma were deacons and deaconesses at Sharon Baptist. Mm -hmm. That's on Lee Street. On First and Lee. That's mm -hmm. right. Well, it was. It's moved since then. But yes, First and Lee. Now, your, so what year was that? Your when, mom, I, when your mom started, grew up there? 1932. 1932. Not even, not even she, it ha wasn't even 32 yet. Okay. She was born December of 31. And she started going when she was 10 months old. Okay. So, therefore, when I first came to First African Church, I went. First of all, when I first met um, Deborah Booker, and she's a historian, she took me to the history room, and from there, I wanted everybody to meet. I told, I tried to collect the family together to come for the homecoming. That's right. Okay? That's right. So, one of the interesting things about going to the homecoming, and I like to tie this in because we did the, uh, the book club thing I started, we did the book The Yellow White. Yes. And in the yellow white, the 
pastor of the church, Robert Ryland, uh -huh, would, and I don't know whether this was, it was loosely uh, based, based on true stuff in Richmond, but what they said was, if you made it to the north, and you made it okay, you would write to the church, and the church would give you a letter. Yes. Letting you know that, hey, John made it, so-and-so made it. Right. Correct? Right. So it did happen, for real. Yes. The ironic thing was when I got to the church, you handed me a letter. Did I hand you a letter? From the That's boy right. Right the That's what So I'm like, when I was reading the book, I said, wait a minute here. Isn't that something? I, put the, I was listening to it. And I, I cut it off. I said, wait a minute. I got a letter when I went there. I heard, forgot I said, that. he must have known that this is what you do traditionally. Yes. Write to the church. Yes. And he said in the letter that the picture that he sent was in the Valentine's Museum. Mm -hmm. And he wanted the church to know. At the time, he was 92 mm -hmm. years old, and he wanted the church to know. I, I just had forgotten about that because it was so fortuitous. When, when Carolyn was at the door, and we're talking not about 14th and Border anymore. We're now at 2700 Haynes Avenue. And she was at the door trying to explain to some of the deaconesses who she was and why she was there, the information she wanted. And they weren't familiar with it. I didn't know her. Mm -hmm. She didn't know me. But it just so happens I was going to do work in the history room. And one of them looked up and said, oh, there's Deborah now. And she said, Carolyn said, I'm a member of the Wright family. Do you know what? I said, yes. Yes, I know the Wrights. I said they were big in our church as far as the whole music department mm -hmm. originated with William Wright Sr. Mm -hmm. And from that point on, we went on up the stairs, and you're right, and I handed you the letter. I forgot. But you, you handed me the letter when I went to, came to church. When I got there, that's when... when we, for homecoming? Homecoming. That's you handed me the letter. Okay. But then, when I got moved up to the history room, I said, history room? She pulled out books. And she bought some with her, and it was like, wow. I could see some people I recognized, like my aunt, my great aunt, I recognized her. But I had no idea that, even looking at the picture, that my great-great-grandfather was on the picture. I knew it was my great-grandfather. And it was just like, she, the stories that she told me, I think it was very important that we do this portion of it and talk about the history that I found out when I got there. About, his, about your family. Yeah, about the family and about the church. You know, since it's Black History Month, just go ahead and, and, and talk about it. Um, I was so um, excited that I was telling the family, but my cousin Ricky met me there. Mm -hmm. And when we got there in the room, and it was like, um, I'm still thinking, um, hey, I'm bringing, I'm, I'm coming just to bring this little picture from 1949. She started pulling out books from 1928 and pictures from way, way back and a letter that said that the orchestra started in, what, 19... Gosh. Early this, 1900? Right, because this is 1928. Mm -hmm. And that was already organized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was like 19, um, mm -hmm. 18, 19, or maybe sooner. But I, um, I, Ricky, and then Deborah pulled out the recording they record and record, recorded us talk. Oh, yes. Did some oral history. And I'm like, what? Now, I got to hear more about this. So, she took us around. And one of the things that stuck out with me, that uh, Maggie Walker mm -hmm. was a member of the church. Mm -hmm. And then Ricky, my cousin, um, said we uh, that our family traditionally banked at her at the bank, the bank. Mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. that's when Deborah took us back to the history room and showed us the initiative that the church had with her where everybody was saving pennies that's and those right. little jobs. Little Can you explain, start with? Just like you said, I mean, just like you said, Maggie Walker was a grown woman at 14th and Broad. She mm -hmm. was a grown woman, um, but she, with the church's permission, introduced these little penny banks that the church, the missionaries would just go around and, you know, the children would walk behind the deacons and they would drop their pennies in the bank. You know how the deacons would do offering? 
Don't worry. The, 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 the deacons were in charge of offerings. So the deacons would go up the aisle with the plate, and the adults would put their dollars and everything in the plate. The children, with their pennies, would put their pennies, dimes, nickels, in the little penny bank. And we just had one in the history room, and I explained that to her. It was the whole experience meant more to me, I think, that, or as much to me as it, as it did to you. And then when she brought Ricky, who, when I was talking about how uh, MCV bought the church, mm -hmm. the 14th and Broad, and he told me that he played taps on the coronet on the front steps of First African Baptist Church downtown when we were turning over the keys mm -hmm. to MCV. Mm -hmm. I was stunned. Mm -hmm. We didn't know each other from Adam, and all of this history is coming up. It still makes me cry. I mean, oh. it, 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 it but you know, um, Deborah, awesome. I think, um, you know, just the, you know, I, I can relate to what you're saying because it was, it was blowing my mind because it was like, I what? had no <laughs> idea um, that it went that far. Well, you tell know, me, let me ask, because your memory is better than mine, because I'm older than you are. <laughs> what made you, tell me again, what made you come to First African that very first day? What happened? Number one, I, I always feel if I find information, I feel a responsibility to find out and go further. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm never a type of person to say, oh, 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 that's a picture, okay. I, I'm always going to go a step further because I want to know. Mm -hmm. I want to, I like to find, I like history. I like to, and I, I saw the picture, number one, I felt like the church should know. Mm -hmm. I felt like for some reason, hey, this church that, that many years ago may not even know about this picture, may not know about the orchestra. Let me, I thought I was telling you something. Oh yeah, okay, okay. okay. <laughs> That's number one. So then when, once I came to the homecoming and then you handed me the letter, that's when I still just didn't rest on that. Mm -hmm. I went to Williamsburg. Yes. And I found um, William Wright III. Uh -huh. And I learned that it was a um, one, two, three. He was the third. I came in, and because I, uh, he was not 92, and when I came in, um, I, I said, I, I am from Richmond, and I am Carolyn. And I am the granddaughter of Carol Wright Sr. and um, great granddaughter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of Carol Wright Sr. Carol Wright Jr. is my grandfather. My mom's name is Carolyn, and I'm Carolyn. And when I came in, I showed him pictures of his family. It was like. And how did he receive you? What? He was like, oh, he sat down, and I, I, I um, audio tape. Yes. A video, well, yeah, of the conversation when, when he went on to tell me, you know, like about the church, why he wrote the letter. He's getting older. He thinks the church should know. And, and he listed in the um, letter everybody mm -hmm. in the family that played in the orchestra. Just like that. And so um, from there, um, I would co um, contact him from time to time. And then um, I went to Virginia Union and I saw Doug Wilder. Mm -hmm. And, um, we, I mean, we were in the tent together, and I was telling him, he said he knew them, and I showed him his picture. And he was like, yeah, I took a picture with uh, Mr. Wilder, and I sent the picture to William Wright Sr. Mm -hmm. Let him know, no, the third. Yes. I let him know that, um, that he was still living. He asked about it. And I told him, hey, he did ask about you, and I showed him your picture. And so it was like really, you know, glad I knew, had that information. Um, because I met you, but I think one of the things that stuck out um, for with with the information you told me about how the church and how people did a lot better in some ways than we're doing today. Mm -hmm. They saved, they had money to um, do take care of their needs, and they lived middle class. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they lived well, um, mm -hmm. and they had um, you know. In my family, I know Rick, Ricky said the family um, tradition was you kept quiet, you worked, they played in the band, they um, worked, paid your bills on Friday after you get, when you get paid, and you saved, and it, it was just what you did. Yeah. May I ask your mom a question? Mm -hmm. 
you were talking about what we call now colorism. Mm -hmm. The rights that I knew were fair. Mm -hmm. And they had um, hazel eyes. Yes. And, um, but I never saw, even though, it, of course, at that age, because, and I'm talking about in the 50s, because I was born in 51, so I was a child. I was six when we moved to 2700 Hanks Avenue, but I never saw that colorism, thank God, in church. You know, mm -hmm. I never, the, 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 I started to say the choir, the orchestra was people of many colors. Mm -hmm. And even though at the time, the lighter you are, the straighter your hair, the color of your eyes, so, somehow equated to your intelligence and your, but I never saw that passed along in church. Okay. You know, they weren't that those kinds of people mm -hmm. that I, they didn't treat me right. any differently. Of course, I was a child, but they didn't mm -hmm. treat my mom any differently either. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to let you know that. Well, you know, uh, when she first told me about her journey trying to find out, I really was kind of hostile about it. I said, I, they, they've never wanted me. Yeah. I, I don't have desire to know nothing about them as far as I, you know, as I was concerned. But I'm glad that I did listen. At first, I didn't even want to hear it. I didn't even want to hear it, I'll hear about it. But today, mm -hmm. thanks to God, I, I want to know, you need to know. Sometimes we need to know about ourselves, even yes. though it may be some things that hurt you. Well, and see, that's, forward. that's the thing about colorism. Colorism is not like... This one. That's my mother. So, colorism isn't like racial bigotry. Because mm -hmm. colorism is black on black. Yeah. It's us. That's what that's it is. What, us. That's what we're doing to each other. Yes. You know? Now, one of the things I wanted to um, talk about, and I think the triumph of um, when, this, when the church started, it was the pastor, we was the president of Richmond College which is the University of Richmond. Yeah. And um, the pastor, at that time, black people could not pastor, pastor a church. Right. Okay? Now, from where, where you taught me, the black, the white church was on the first floor. The white And in the balcony. The yeah, the congregation. The balcony mm -hmm. was where the black mm -hmm. people could congregate. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. yeah. And so um, I would say from that, um, hearing that, and then when they branched off, mm -hmm. where did the white church go? Right and around what, the corner. What's the name of that church? First Baptist Church. Mm -hmm. We were, the building first was. First African. No. We were First Baptist, mm -hmm. white and black. Mm -hmm. First Baptist. Okay. And then when they branched off, they became, they were still First Baptist, and we were First Baptist colored. Really? Mm -hmm. And if you go okay. downtown to the building, because the building is still there, yes. and look up at the headstone, it says First Baptist Color. Mm -hmm. But then, after the congregation, the, the black congregation got so big and they started to split off, we there was a, a First Baptist Color, or Second, second Baptist mm -hmm. Color, mm -hmm. and Third Baptist Color. Third Baptist Color is Ebenezer. Okay. So then, so then they threw an African term, the African name, to differentiate themselves from First Baptist, who was growing by leaps and bounds, and then bought property on Monument Avenue, which is where they are now. Okay, so they're on Monument. It's, called, it's still called First, First Baptist. Baptist. Okay. Yeah. So then we became First Baptist. Yes, African. I see them every Sunday. Every yeah. Sunday. That's our church. That's, that's, that's the original that's the church. church. Oh, so goodness. the church was sold. To the black church, yes. bought the church from the white church. Yes. Okay. And from there, once they purchased it, they became they had more problems because they they well you can't enter from broad. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yes, we purchased the building the way the building was built when it was. Two congregations, or mm -hmm. you know, a mixed congregation, mm -hmm. and the front door. But see, this is in the building was built in 
18. I can't remember, and I don't want to say it wrong. But the building was built, and the front wrong book, and the front door was on Broad Street. Sure. So when we bought the building and then went to renovate the building, blacks couldn't own property on Broad Street, so we had to reconfigure the building to put the front door on the 14th Street side. <laughs> okay. Yes. So once that was done, great the thing job. is, that was a great, uh, great cost and expense, but the thing is, they had the money to do it. We, we raised the money, money to do yeah. it. We, the, yes, we were resilient. The people of the congregation of First African, and, and like you said, like Ricky said, you paid your bills, you kept your head down, you did your job, but we were resilient and we believed in tithing and we, if they had to sell dinners and whatever, mm -hmm. we raised that money mm -hmm. Churchy style. to mm -hmm. renovate that church and turn, <laughs> turn, the front, turn the building so that the front door could be on the 14th Street side because we couldn't own property on Broad Street. Yeah, oh, so. Wow. So great, then when you, um, great so, information. yeah, oh yeah. So then um, from there, um, the church grew out of that building, the congregation grew. Well, now that's, um, it wasn't so much that the congregation grew out of that building. Was MCV pushing? I'm telling you. You know how you talked about down the bottom? Mm -hmm. Remember the viaduct that went over the... The viaduct, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So MCV was growing at leaps and, and bounds mm -hmm. and acquiring property. Because when, when we bought the building, beside the building were houses. And mm -hmm. across the street, they were houses. Mm -hmm. It was a community. And right there in the hill, that's where yeah, I lived they were with houses. my other grandmama. Mm -hmm. But MCV, because it was the hospital of the state, mm -hmm. was acquiring property and acquiring property all around the church, all around. And on top of that, the Transportation Board of Virginia and the United States, I guess, decided that they needed a highway, an interstate highway. And so they chose to put 95, I-95, straight through Richmond, which tore up the community of Navy Hill, mm -hmm. Jackson Ward, mm -hmm. and it just abolished not really abolished, but obliterated the community. People had to move mm -hmm. because the houses were being torn down. So, with MCV buying all the property around the church, with the highway department running uh, 95 through Richmond and taking people's homes, you know, what's that called? Imminent domain. Imminent domain. Imminent domain. Mm -hmm. Taking mm -hmm. people's property. The community was having to move. We already had community living down the bottom. The viaduct was torn down because 95 ran through that. Mm -hmm. And the viaduct was the bridge between Family downtown and, Church, and Hill. Church Hill. Yes, right. So those people, you know, now had to find another, because the trolley ran across the mm -hmm. viaduct. They had to find another way to get to church. So it was a combination of things that caused the church, the deacons, the pastor, the trustees, to try to figure out what to do because community was being torn apart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so with MCV trying to purchase all the land around the building um, then the trustees and and the church officials decided that it was time to find a, a different location mm. yeah well um, um, listening to um, that your the history that you share with me and then going back to my cousins Ricky archives of pictures. I took pictures and I found out how did William Wright Sr. How did he even get to that church? And I found that out. Oh, tell me because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things was it was a um, someone and I read the name. I can't think of the name right now, but he was um, affiliated with Virginia State. Okay. And William Wright Sr. was going to Virginia State. Can and you name something else. It was called Virginia um, Virginia College or Virginia Normal School? Yeah, Virginia Normal. Normal. Yeah, Virginia Normal. Uh huh. And um, he was going to that school, and the man felt like he was he was a um, played all the instruments, so he wanted music mm -hmm. in First African. So the so man from Virginia State went to First African. Went to First African. Okay, I don't know who that is. 
Yeah. yeah. So just think, Universal Richmond pastor was was the first pastor. Mm -hmm. Then it was sold to VCU. Yeah. But then somebody from Virginia State was going there, and he formed the orchestra. And that's how I started. But the interesting thing um, that I found out that he, through the news article that William Wright Sr. was a cartoonist. He did um, wicker furniture um, and he had a garden and um, he invented the signal. Which, now which William? This is Sr. This is Sr., okay. Uh, invented a, um, the signal for the car. He said, but someone... Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, the traffic someone, signal. Yeah, yeah, for the inside the car. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh he, the blinker! Yeah, <clears throat> he, he invented, but he but someone took took the idea took the from uh, oh. from him, oh. and um, he, my, as my mom would say, that they were um, you know strong family values. They, oh, you yes. know, that, um, her great her grandfather took his, his mom to the store every week. Um, they were right. just um, a very Carol. close knit um, family, and. Um, the other thing that stick out in my mind, how um, the music mm -hmm. and how I also saw in 1980, they were still celebrating William H. Wright um, at having some type of concert or something at First African music Church. Music was very important. And it was, um, how important it was, and even, um, they say he did it for 40 years. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was, um, um, I noted that in my mind. That, that was a very long time to to do that work and once he passed on then his son okay you're talking about the, the, what from senior passed okay then the, and then deacon right as you know him his son the, uh, yeah he, well, he continued uh -huh. to be yeah. a part of the mm -hmm. orchestra and my grandfather carl harrison senior mm -hmm. Now one. what happened we what big. I found out um, at William the third funeral that Maurice traveled with the Ringling Brothers Circus. My goodness! So that's where he was. Oh my goodness! Mm -hmm. So what he, I'm showing them is a picture of the church Sunday School Orchestra from 1956. Oh, can I just hold this up for a second? Mm-hmm. And on the picture, who's on there, Mom? Your papa's on there. Emmett. Just read the names, and then you can you can so that he'll he can get everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. W. H. Wright, Senior, Director. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Maxine B. Robinson, Pianist. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Emmett Wright, First Violin. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thomas Barrett, First Violin. Master Cordell Hill, first violin. Mr. Carl H. Wright, first trumpet. Mr. W. H. Wright, Junior, Jr., first trumpet and baritone saxophone. Mr. Emmett N. Wright, second trumpet. Mr. John W. Jarrett, tenor saxophone. Mm -hmm. Mr. A. M. Bacroft, mm -hmm. tenor saxophone, Mr. J. H. Fauntleroy, senior, alto saxophone, Mr. Cornelius Cooper, first clarinet, Mr. Robert Smith, first clarinet, and Miss Jean M. Wright, second clarinet. Oh my goodness. It just so pretty. You can see all the, 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 Orchestra was filled with the Wright family. Yeah. Yes. And that mm -hmm. this was 1956. Filled with the Wright family. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. So the, the 50th commemorative book, what year was that? 19, yeah, April, it, it was, Sunday, April 29, 1928. Uh, and that's that one. That's this one. Yes. And that one, that was Maggie Walker's in that one. Probably. She was a member of... Also, that's one I remember seeing. And, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I noticed um, other, like Henry Box Brown, he was... A member of the church. Could you tell about that? You know, uh, 
of course, you know, all this is before my time because oh, yeah. this was during slavery. So yeah. the the story is um, Henry Fox Brown was a member, of, or, I'm sorry, um, a resident of Richmond, Virginia. And I, please forgive me if I get the information wrong, I think his family was sold from him. And when that occurred, he, did, he, he knew it was time for him to leave. And he, with the help of Quakers, boxed himself up in a crate with little holes to breathe and boxed himself to Philadelphia mm -hmm. by U.S. mail. Because <laughs> it was time to go. Um, uh, I'm thinking who else. Um, I'm looking, thinking about the different other um, history of the church that people will be familiar with. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, See, in my head, besides Maggie Walker, did you bring the book, Mom? Mm -hmm. Henry, did you remember to bring my book back? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Besides Maggie Walker and okay? Henry Box Brown, I can't think of anybody, and, and of course Douglas Wilder, anybody with notoriety. Um, but we had like Rosa Bowser. What about Art Edge? He. Bill Bojangle was in there. Did you, did you look at the book? Bill Bojangle. I just got it. I <laughs> Bill Bojangle. Um, but Arthur Ashe didn't go to our church. No. Okay. No. Bill Bojangle. I know that I bought a, um, a little book and had some information on it, and I was going to get some notes. But um, I know that he was a member of the church. Just different. Uh, we had, there are people who stick out of my mind are people who worked in the community. Worked like, in the community. Yes, church. like yeah. Deacon um, Fred Tharps and his wife Maud Tharps, who were the superintendent of the colored mm -hmm. orphan boys and they had a farm mm -hmm. in the Verina area and they serviced and raised over 3,000 boys. Mm -hmm. That's that's worth noting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes. No big name but yeah, you never know, got the real it, right. thing for what they did. Right. Yeah. Right. It's I know Virginia what you history. Mean. It might not be national history. Yes. Yeah. And you know what? I should have brought because there are more. I just right now can't pull them up. I'm yeah, I, I actually was gonna just, but hey, we got the most important thing up for now. Uh, and we can always can come back later. Yeah, because I, I thought we were gonna talk about your history. Go ahead. <laughs> well, we it well I, I you did, did. I no, did you talk did. About, we did. Yeah, we did. and I can talk about. I wanna mention about growing up and mm -hmm. like as I I grew up. Um, like I said, we, from my mother, I always knew, like, little nuggets. But I think had I known everything fully about our history, I think I would have probably named Chelsea Carolyn. And I probably would have named Corey Andrew. Sang anthems and hymns. Mm -hmm. Because that's the kind of music we knew. Mm -hmm. You know, we had a white minister. Mm -hmm. We had white deacons mm -hmm. at first because they had to... Because this was all pre-slavery. This mm -hmm. is 1841. Mm -hmm. So they had to get permission from the General Assembly. Um, when when Carolyn told the story about the letters being sent saying, I have now... You ready? Um, yeah, I'll shoot it. I have you shooting it? <laughs> I, have, I have it on. Oh, okay. So, okay. yeah, just go into it. Okay. okay. Um, when you talked about the letters that people would send to the church to say that they have relocated, mm -hmm. and you... When you went to a different church, you, you either you were mm -hmm. you were either baptized mm -hmm. or you were you were declared a member by letter. By letter, and the letter meant that the le that you asked first African to write a letter saying that you were a member of good standing, but mm -hmm. you are now relocating mm -hmm. and you want to join this church by letter. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but anyhow, back to the music, because we came from a we were black congregants of a white church, mm -hmm. or, you know, own predominantly white church. No, that's not true because there were more brown people than there were white people at the time. That's why we, that's another reason why the split sort of happened. But anyhow, um, that's the music that we, we you know, I'm hymns, glad I said that. hymns and anthems and, yes, and it, the choral, and it was a choir, it was choral music with altos, sopranos, er, basses, tenors, you know. like, what's and that's what we sang. Now, uh, here's a little aside. 
Mrs. Colgate of the Colgates mm -hmm. came to Richmond with her husband, and I don't know what why he was here, I, I have no idea, but she had heard of the music at First African. Mm. And she came to First Africa, well, First Baptist Color, okay? She came, heard the choir sing, was so impressed that she donated the money for the chandeliers to be put up in, in the church. And we had, because we had like gaslighting at the time, mm -hmm. she donated the money for the chandelier, these chandeliers, wait, oops. Mm. These chandeliers were you paid. You still have it? Well, the, that's in the old building. Okay. And they are still there, even though the old building was being used for the nurses at the MCV. Mm -hmm. Right this minute, I hear that the building is not being used, but those chandeliers are still hanging from the ceiling. They probably never get rid of them because it's historic. Can well, I ask no. you, no, did, the, the um, did the orchestra and the choir come? Oh, we always had big at the time, big concerts. And that was a way of raising money. We would have big concerts. We would not charge people for coming, but we would take an offering, you know? And some of that money would be earmarked for the building fund or the missionaries or the children or, but yeah, we had a music department and it included the orchestra and the organists and the pianists, and the choirs, and I can show you some more choirs, but yeah, all of that, music was a big part, and so when you talked about going to Ebenezer, and hearing <laughs> these, this operatic music, they, see, that had come from First Africa, you yeah. know, because that's what we, that's what we knew, mm -hmm. that's what we knew, mm -hmm. I, I, and everybody, um, Nobody looked like the people for the church I was going to. Yeah. What did mm -hmm. they look like? Dressed in finery. Oh, really? Nice, nice, you know. Well, you could. Okay, okay. here we go. <laughs> Show you some. Again, 1920. This is 28 now. Yes, they all wore it, suits. Yeah. Almost tails, uh -huh. almost tuxedos. Mm -hmm. You know, they had suits. Or the women had beautiful hats and mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the way they dressed. Wonder what caused them to break away from First African. Who, who them? You said the uh, Ebenezer Church came from. Oh, because again, it was more. It was three churches. Relocation of people. Mm -hmm. You know, like the church was huge. One of the ministers, and I can't remember if it was James Holmes or W. T. Johnson, baptized like three thousand people, four thousand people, mm. and the church was becoming. It was huge, mm -hmm. and because people were. Well, again, Richmond history is just fascinating. Good and bad. I'm loving this. Good and bad. You know, so, do you know what redlining is? Redlining is a term that the financial institutions use to use say, it. black people can move here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Black people can't move here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as redlining as the districts or the areas in the city of Richmond became more open to black people, mm -hmm. hence Northside, Edgewood Avenue, which your, was it your grand, great grandfather? Your, your great grandfather, your grandfather. My great great. Senior. Your great great. Senior. Okay, Edgewood. William Wright Senior mm -hmm. lived on Edgewood. Mm -hmm. My great grandmother lived on Edgewood mm -hmm. in the 2700 block mm -hmm. because the banks were opening up. Mm -hmm. The areas that blacks could, could move mm -hmm. into. So with that, the, there are people who didn't have to travel as far as 14th and Broad. They could go to Lee Street, mm -hmm. you know, where Third African Baptist, which became Ebenezer. Mm -hmm. They could go to that church. It was closer. And plus, there were people who, and when I say that they left First African, they didn't walk away. They left in good standing. They, it was like saying, we would like because of circumstances, because of travel, because of, we would like to, to relocate, a, a group of us would like to relocate here. The letter was written, the property put was on, Put on fire. Yeah, property was They written. don't do it no more, I don't think. Don't do what anymore? Like if you, um, I want to go to another church, and, and they, they don't ask for the letter and stuff anymore. 
Or they should. I don't know if they... I think that... I don't know. I, I don't know. You're right. I don't, I don't know. But I can say that in Maybe my, so in my yeah. lifetime, I have heard the pastor say, and we are receiving brother so-and-so by letter. Mm -hmm. By letter. Mm -hmm. Me too. I've heard that. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I seem like I don't hear it anymore. I don't know. I hear it by Christian experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. By yes. Christian yes. experience. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'm really excited to know about um, how you all had a white pastor. Well, because y'all was upstairs, they, the white people was downstairs. Yes, and then they sold it all to you all. Yes, and they got but it was the still, original. The First Baptist Church is on Monument Avenue mm -hmm. now. Was a part of them, we, right? Yes, we were all mm -hmm. one congregation. Mm -hmm. And when it was during the time of Nat Turner's rebellion, mm -hmm. this was like eighteen thirty nine type of thing, and the politics. And the racial division was starting. See, this was all pre-Civil War, right? Mm -hmm. You know, racial division, Nat Turner's Rebellion. Um, you couldn't congregate. In fact, church was the only place that blacks could congregate. Could congregate, yeah. Right? So it got to the point where the white land landowners were bringing their enslaved people to church. But they couldn't really get to them to govern them because they were sitting upstairs in the balcony and mm -hmm. the white landowners were sitting downstairs in the main floor. This is great. So they just decided that maybe we, we would be better off. They, they also recognized that the African American people worship differently. Mm -hmm. We like interaction. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. You know, whereas for them it was a, the nod of the head, you mm -hmm. know, it was a mm -hmm. quiet type of thing. So they recognized that maybe this is the time. Mm -hmm. So they, the, the congregation split, but it was still pre-Civil War. We had no rights. We mm -hmm. couldn't own property. We couldn't, so they had to, still had to govern us. Mm -hmm. They had to, it, it was called like an experiment. They had to write to the General Assembly, get permission to have these black people in this building over here. We're right around the corner. We're still watching them. You know, <laughs> we got deacons going over there. We got Robert Ryland from Richmond Back, I mean Richmond College. He's gonna be the minister. So we're still watching them, you know. And even though they didn't come to church every Sunday, there were at least two who had to, you know, two people, two white deacons had to be there, type of thing. You know, they took turns, and it wasn't just for us Baptists. It was um, the other white churches too, hmm. white. Uh, Maybe Second Baptist white type of thing, you know. They, they all. There were three churches that the de the white deacons came from. So they were governing us, mm -hmm. and even though black people couldn't preach, they could pray, and they could the they as the, as black people became deacons. And this was not far long after the organization of the church. We had black deacons. Was still being governed now. But they could get up and they could exhort, exhortation. They could pray. And sometimes they would pray a sermon mm -hmm. and then say amen and sit down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. Mm. Oh my goodness. That would, that's great. I mean, this is something I never heard of. Pray a sermon. Oh, pray a wow. sermon. And, you know, well, yeah, they, they wanted to still be in control. Of course, they had to be. I mean, mm -hmm. by law, they had to be. That was the law. We still couldn't learn to read. That mm -hmm. was the law. Mm -hmm. Reverend Robert Ryland got into trouble because he um, wrote a book called The Catechism for Colored Children and Servants. Ooh. And it was a book. So how were they supposed to learn what mm. this catechism was, right? So during Sunday school, they uh, would speak from the book, but, you know, the children and the Older adults, when I say older, I mean, <clears throat> I don't mean old people, but there were children and there were grown men going to Sunday, going to evening classes, and they were using this catechism that he had written, and of course they were sort of learning from the written word. Mm -hmm. And he got into trouble, and he had to, uh, he meaning Robert Rylan, and he had to convince the General Assembly that he was not teaching reading. 
That's the mm. main thing. They didn't want us to, to be educated. Mm-hmm. They want us to believe everything they said. Yeah. And, and in today's context, that's a lot of people don't believe in the church because they believe it came from our white forefathers and everything and all this stuff. They claim it could be a myth. It's something they made up. Uh-huh. They wrote the book. They did the, how do we know that James, Peter, Paul wrote all of this? And it is something to question. Yeah. It's definitely something to question. And um, you know those letters you talked about? Uh-huh. They got into trouble for that because First African was not a legitimate post office, but the letters were coming in to say that we have joined so-and-so's church and the General Assembly maybe rightfully so or not, said, how do we know they're not passing on um, Underground Railroad information mm-hmm. in these letters? They mm-hmm. had to stop that. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Well, this has really been good. I'm this trying to think of this. Um, we should be well, do, do more. Um, um, be together another, more. Another time? Get... Another day? Yeah. Just okay. like we work this out. And we, this worked out pretty well. I mean, I said I'm free this date and this date. I got, I've got from this time to this time. Mm-hmm. And Carolyn said, I talked to, I talk to your it. friend and there we go. Here we are. Yes. Well, um, I want to thank you, um, Deborah, you for coming. Welcome. I'll thank you for coming. Can and I say one more thing? Yeah. You know, you were talking about a Mr. Booker. Yes. He, I, I, I'd love to know who he was because I don't think I'm related to him. And James Edward Booker. No, nope, no, I'm not related to him. <laughs> and uh, his brother was the um, principal of Blackwell. Okay. And he was my uh, sixth and seventh grade teacher in Buckhannon School. And the next time we'll talk more about Buckhannon School yes. and how, like you said, yes. eminent domain, they came yep. and tore the whole neighborhood down to put the city jail and stuff yep. in there. Yep, yep, yep. And oh, I wow. have, we had members of our church who just passed away. Lady was 102 when she passed away. Who lived on Buckhannon Street, and she was as proud about that as anybody could be. Mm-hmm. Wow. Like you said, it was a family. It was, it was a, a family. It was a community. And, and nobody had any more than anybody else. Right. Not like yeah. when, the, when the North Side. She got a bathroom cleaner. <laughs> Well, this is just the beginning of, of something new. Um, it could be a series of different things um, growing up in Richmond. And if you out there, somebody want to contact me, 804-674-1000, where we can maybe continue, or you may know family members that may have a contribution to this conversation to make it even greater than it is. Um, this is Conversations with Carolyn. We have Deborah Booker here, the historian. A First African Baptist Church, and my mother, Carolyn McLemore, from um, Buckana Street, yeah. <laughs> um, and her grandparents lived on Eight West, no, Grand. Eight West Grand Street, where she spent a lot of time and really went to church from time to time with her grandparents. And, um, and her grandparents were big. Not influencers, but they worked hard at First so African close. Baptist Church. Yes. And we found out that her grandparents lived on Graham Road and I lived on Graham Road. Yeah. At the end of the of the block. Oh. So you were right there almost cat a corner from Laurel School. I was right across the street. <laughs> I ran across the street and went to school every day. That's, and you could come home for lunch. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that's that's well, Richmond history. That's <laughs> Richmond history and it's history in our own words. I love it. And um, thank you for joining. And thank um, you, 804-674-1000. <laughs> and my email is carolyn804 at gmail. Thanks for joining. Thank you.